pump down. Okay, and so now we're recording. Um, and I use the headphones just because I don't like to be locked in behind the uh, podium if I don't have to. So um, I'm obviously your instructor for your auditing class, uh, Accounting 310. A uh, little bit about my background. Um, I am kind of new to Golden Gate. Uh, this is my first class in probably about 10 years. Uh, I taught at Golden Gate from 2000 to about 2009 or so and uh, went off to do some other work. Um, and so I stopped teaching at Golden Gate for uh, all these years and I'm back now to teach the um, auditing class. Uh, in addition to teaching the auditing class, I have a dual responsibility here at uh, the university. I'm now the director of the accounting programs, and so it's going to be my job uh, not only to teach your class, but also uh, have sort of an outward-facing position representing the university to the various CPA firms, corporations, understanding what they're looking for from our curriculum, bringing that back, helping our instructors to understand what... Uh, the market is looking for, uh, trying to make sure that uh, the firms and the companies understand the uh, benefits that Golden Gate can offer to them with uh, extended education. Maybe they have some employees that are looking for their certification, that sort of thing. So I'm going to be uh, doing that reach out work as well. Uh, I currently teach at several universities here in the Bay Area. Uh, I teach at San Francisco State. I teach the accounting, introductory to accounting, introductory to managerial, uh, governmental accounting. Uh, I'm teaching their advanced accounting class, uh, and I'm going to be teaching their ethics course uh, starting in the spring. So I teach quite a bit at San Francisco State. I currently have two classes, two introductory classes. I also teach at San Jose State. I teach uh, four classes there, introductory to financial and governmental accounting. Uh, in the state university system, you can teach a maximum of six classes. So if I'm teaching two at San Francisco, I can only teach four at San Jose. Next semester, I'll teach four at um, San Francisco, and I'm only going to teach one at San Jose, the governmental accounting class. Uh, I also teach at Stanford uh, University. I teach um, at a introductory to accounting class to um, engineers. Um, they require that they understand something about financial accounting. I can pretty much say anything I want to them about accounting and they write it down and believe it. Uh, so that tends out to work out okay. Although the first time I taught the class, I said assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. They said, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm like, okay, guys, there's no discussion here. Okay, and this is just how it is. So, um, so I've been doing that for about uh, a year, a little over a year now. I've also taught at UC Berkeley, uh, taught um, a tax class there, as well as intermediate accounting and um, introductory to financial and managerial. I'm not teaching at UC Berkeley uh, this, uh, this year. I've obviously got a lot of things going on, so I have to back off of some of the things. Uh, I teach for a CPA review course called Becker Professional Education. I don't know if you've heard of Becker. Becker is the leading CPA review course. How many of you plan to take your CPA exam at some point in time? So you may consider Becker as one of the courses that uh, you might want to take. One of the things I'm working on is trying to get a live CPA review course uh, here on campus so that you can walk in and take your CPA classes and pass a CPA exam there. I know that a lot of day, lot, lot these days folks take the class online. Any interest? Live CPA where someone will come in and actually teach you, prep you for the exam? Okay. Yeah, so something that um, I'm going to try to work with um, the folks to try to get a live class here, see how that turns out for us. Um, that's one of my projects. Um, that's my teaching. I've been teaching the CPA exam, by the way, for 24, 25 years. So that's how I started teaching. Taught at Golden Gate for those years. And then I uh, started teaching at San Francisco State about five years ago. Added San Jose, added Stanford, added Berkeley. And I also teach an auditing class at the College of San Mateo. So 
I'm virtually all over the place, uh, literally all over the place. Um, now, you may say, so that's all you've done is taught. No, I worked for the federal government. As we know, there was a governmental accounting uh, component in there. When I taught here at Golden Gate, I was teaching the governmental accounting. What is it, 304? Accounting 304, the governmental class? I forget the number now. 104, I forget now. But uh, I uh, worked for the federal government for 26 years, an agency called the Government Accountability Office. Um, GAO is the auditing investigative arm of Congress. Anything Congress wants looked at, they turn to my office to do. I spent about 15 of those years in financial statement audit and then um, rolled over to operational auditing, auditing the actual programs uh, for about nine of those years. So I retired from the federal government about five years ago when I started teaching at SF State. Uh, what happened is SF State said, hey, can you come teach governmental accounting here? And I said, sure. Can you teach introduction to financial? Sure. Introduction to managerial. And I looked and I said, uh-oh. I don't have time to do my job. I better tell San Francisco State I'm sorry I overcommitted. And then the devil on the other side said, no, why don't you retire from the government and pursue the teaching thing? And so that's uh, kind of been what I've been doing for the last five years. Now, if you're doing the math and saying, so this dude must be about 90 if he's been teaching the CPA exam for 25 years and he's been teaching, uh, worked for the federal government for 26 years, that's 50 years right there. Um, the teaching the CPA exam and teaching at Golden Gate was happening concurrently with teaching here at GGU <coughs> and teaching the CPA exam. So um, our office was over at 301 Howard in San Francisco, so I just used to kind of walk across the street. And we actually used to have CPA review courses here at GGU as well. So, um, so that's a little bit about my background. I am a CPA here in the state of California. I got my license a long, long time ago before you were born. Uh, so now my main job is to uh, keep my license current uh, by keeping up with my continuing professional education. And uh, what's nice about the CPE is you get credit for teaching. So you can get 40 of the 80 hours you need every two years teaching and so I teach CPE classes uh, for Becker as well and those are basically well they used to put a camera in your face and you just had to pretend like um, you weren't reading from the prom teleprompter now we do it all from home where I just sit there and do an audio uh, version almost kind of like what I'm doing here uh, of the course so um, so that's pretty much what I have been up to from the time I had hair till now, okay, going forward. So it's good to see some of my uh, students coming from uh, San Francisco State. And yeah, I'm, huh? I took my very first uh, accounting class with you. Right? Accounting over here, right? Yeah. I converted you over to the dark side, right? Over yeah. to the accounting, over, the, over to the force. Okay, good. Uh, so what I'm going to do right now, guys, uh, I'd kind of like to go around since we have a small group and uh, just kind of get a sense of where you all are, what some of your, you know, goals are um, when you're thinking you're going to graduate, that kind of stuff, okay? And uh, then we'll go ahead and go through the e-learn, how it's organized, go through the syllabus, um, take a little break. And then I think we should be able to wrap up the Chapter 1 slides tonight, which are posted. I see um, you got a chance to print them. I have an annoying habit. I tweak my presentation up to the presentation, so please don't freak out if the slides aren't exactly what you printed. Uh, I just can't stop revising a presentation every time I look at them. I'm like, hmm, wait a minute. This goes better over here, so bear with me. But we'll go through the slides. I think we should have time to do the quiz and the homework um, that is set up in McGraw-Hill Connect. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how that's set up. I want to get your input, um, how you feel about having to buy the book versus making the book optional. And I've got some different ideas there um, where I can. I like to save you a couple bucks. If we don't have to have you buy the book, then maybe we can get around that. But let's see. Because uh, sometimes if you don't buy the book, you don't get the software, the materials that I'm able to provide you become a little thin. 
and that's not something that's necessarily good, but I can't necessarily just disseminate tons of material um, to you without actually having you buy the book. It wouldn't be you know, ethically appropriate. So I give you some of the stuff, but I can't give it all to you. So we'll talk more about that. Okay, so with that, I'm just going to start with the front here and go around and um, just, you know, your name and where you're at in your education and maybe, you know, what your professional goals are. Okay. Uh, Michael Ink. Um, I'm just beginning my master's degree in uh, oh, master's MS in accounting. Um, I mean, I'm hoping to come out with a master's degree. Um, currently unemployed, but I'm looking for uh, an accounting position. Okay, and your undergraduate is accounting? Oh, in accounting. Yes. Also in accounting? Yeah. Okay, okay, great. And uh, CPA? Oh, I passed my CPA exam. Oh, you passed already? Yeah. Oh, oh, awesome. So this auditing stuff is going to be old hat for you if you've already passed the auditing part of the exam. <laughs> so that's excellent. Well, thank you. Welcome. When do you plan to graduate? Um, um, maybe like two years. Two years? Yeah. Okay, awesome. semester um, for accounting. I'm trying to do master's in accounting with a taxation focus. Um, I'm fairly new to accounting. My undergrad's in uh, counseling and I actually was got accepted at GGU for master's of counseling and I, I know, impulsively switched I guess. So, uh, so yeah. Okay. Excellent. What, uh, what made you gravitate towards the county you took a class and fell in love or I'm still trying to figure, figure it out <laughs> so am I so don't feel bad um, yeah. I have a degree in TV and radio broadcasting I wanted to be a sports announcer um, and um, you know so I'm sitting there taking the broadcasting classes getting my AA and uh, announcing the college baseball games um, all during the day at school and at night, I'm going and cleaning up surgery rooms at the hospital. So, you know, after the surgery is over, I'm the guy that goes in and cleans the room, manning the garbage chutes, all that kind of stuff with an AA in broadcasting. So I'm kind of like, hmm, maybe I better, you know, get something that uh, I can maybe get a job, uh, not cleaning toilets, you know. So I uh, took this business 1A class at Chabot College in Hayward community college and it turns out that business 1a is the tricky name for the accounting class right so that somebody will take that class so I'm sitting in there and I'm like what the is going on here so I took my first uh, uh, test and I got a C and I'm like what am I supposed to do here and I still remember the day I fell in love with accounting when I'm like oh everything's either a debit or a credit and you make them balance and if you can figure out cash you know the other one's not that bad and so I thought and I don't have to clean toilets anymore you say if I kind of like hang with this and figure it out so started doing better in the classes after that and got my degree I ultimately transferred to what was then Cal State Hayward so um, and got my degree and passed the CPA exam started working for the government so Huh? Yeah, I mean, no, you know, nobody, there's, <coughs> right now, there's a 14-year-old kid riding a skateboard somewhere that's going to be an accountant. <coughs> he doesn't know it, right? Okay, so nobody really plans, well, maybe, maybe some of you decide you want to be an accountant when you were two. But for the most part, you know, we kind of wander to it. But it's a good way to make a pretty decent, uh, pretty decent living. It's, we, we used to say it's indoors and no heavy lifting, so that's all good, although it looks like you can handle the heavy lifting. But, uh, <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Kimberly. I guess I'll start with the note of what I wanted to do at first. I wanted to be a doctor. turns out I was really bad at chemistry, so I had to drop that. And at math. I don't know why I'm an accountant. Well, I know I'm an accountant. I got really good at math afterwards. Um, but yeah, I wanted to be a doctor, and then somehow I ended up getting undergrad in finance because I figured out that I really love finance. But a year ago, I didn't know I was going to be an accountant. So uh, now I'm going to be an accountant in September. So I got a job offer with Deloitte, so I'm going to start then um, taking the classes here so that I can sit for the CPA. Um, and then hopefully I'll finish the master's degree, but it won't be until I pass the CPA because it might be a long time, like three years or something. But the purpose of me teaching is to help me get to the CPA. 
All right, Deloitte, you're in the um, San Francisco office right across the street here? Yeah. Then? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. So I'll be doing taxation for multifamily. Oh. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not a tax guy, but um, the understanding for some companies like startups and stuff is they don't anticipate that they're having to collect sales tax for multi-state uh, revenues and whatnot, and they end up getting in trouble later on in that they've been having all these sales say, in Texas, and they haven't been collecting the sales tax for Texas, and then they get left holding the bag. So it's a big important uh, area tax consideration area um, cool. so thank you for telling me because I asked around but it seems like the only people I know were the people who interviewed me so I got as for them but not for me yeah yeah because it's my first year and usually it seems like they just start you out somewhere and then you train from there so it's been an exciting I'll see what I can do about getting <laughs> um, when I teach the class at Stanford um, I try to bring in um, somebody from PwC uh, to come in and talk about uh, the startup issues because that class they're entrepreneurs um, but it might be worth it to have uh, since you're interested in multi uh, state tax have someone come in uh, who is a, sort of an expert in that area and uh, even though it's not an auditing subject uh, certainly in the area of assurance services it's something that um, you know we might kind of try to understand how he helps his clients with that so I'll, I'll, I'll try to work on that and uh, you were a member of the Association Latino Professionals for America or Alpha oh, yes. I guess I should talk about that the, the way I joined Trump besides this class was um, I when I was an undergrad I was the president for the Alpha which is Association of Latino Professionals for America uh, at, at the state chapter. And um, we, what we do is that we organize events um, and kind of create, um, I guess the mission is to help students link them with a network that will allow them to find help them find a job in the finance and accounting industry. I think now they do tech as well. Um, but I would say they're mostly specialized in accounting and it was actually through, alpha, through a connection alpha that I made that I was able to get my job at the board. So when I first graduated, I was like, well, you know, I, was, I got all the way up to being president of Alpha. Like, I'm not really sure. Like, I put a lot of effort in. I'm, I mean, I don't know if I enjoyed it. I don't know if it's actually going to lead into a job, but it definitely created a network for me. And then a year later, it just someone reached out to me like, hey, you know, I love your work ethic. Like, you've done really well. Like, I know you're from Alpha. Um, we're looking for someone at Deloitte. And then that's how I got, that's how I got introduced into, like, the, um, the people at Deloitte. And that's how I got my offer. So I would say, like, really try to be part of a group like that. Um, it doesn't have to be, like, in a specific group, but um, there's a lot of accounting organizations out there, and even if you think that it's not going to help you out, it will. It will It will change the way you network, you talk to people, what you know, what you want to do. It just expands your, like, your network and, I guess, your knowledge because you're talking to people who are in diff a lot of different areas of accounting. Yeah, and the F and the A in For America used to be finance and accounting, but they're trying to expand beyond. Now, having been a member of Local 250, the Institutional Workers <coughs> Union, when I was a housekeeper, I'm of the opinion that if they're looking for uh, uh, Latinos for America, they should tap into the um, Institutional Workers Union, but I don't think they're going to do that. So they don't really mean for America, <laughs> Latino profession for America, but they're trying to expand into tech, that kind of thing. Um, I am reaching out to Alpha, to Ascend. Anybody ever heard of Ascend? Ascend is the Asian Accounting Association, so Alpha is the Latino, Ascend is the Asian group. Um, I'm going to reach out to ASWA, the Association of Women Accountants, um, and also uh, NABA, National Association of Black Accountants, and uh, try to get some of this networking um, opportunity to uh, be a little more present here at GGU so that um, you have these opportunities to network. What's good about NABA, Ascend, Alpha, uh, Oswa, uh, they all have professional chapters. So 
uh, that gives you that connection, maybe somebody working at the firm and that. So I'll try to uh, see if we can get them uh, more involved. Now, we do have an accounting fraternity here on campus, um, and it's not Beta Alpha Psi. Anybody recall the name of the organization, the accounting fraternity here? Okay, I'll get some membership information about that because I think what I typically recommend to my students is that they be involved in uh, two groups. One, the on-campus group that's more of a student group, and then one of these professionally affiliated associations, whichever one you like. And it's not like you have to be siloed. You know, you don't have to say, well, I'm Latino, so I have to go to the Latino one, you know. Um, but I think you should be try to be a member of two, um, and that's a good way to start the networking uh, earlier rather than later. The, the name of the group? <coughs> What's the name of it? I'm just. Chi Alpha? Yeah. Chi Alpha, okay. So you're all involved in that, active in that? Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. I'll try to get the meeting schedule and post it up on e-learning, um, but I really <coughs> strongly encourage you uh, where you can to go to those things because um, I think that uh, that networking is important. Okay, thanks, Kimberly. Hi. Hey, um, my name is Tim, and uh, my undergrad major was math, and I was planning to take actuarial, but uh, since I have a, my own business running, so uh, now I'm taking uh, accounting and concentrating on taxation part uh, because uh, I want to stay safe in my business and I want to break the law. So okay, uh, good. Yeah. Not breaking the law is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always easy, right? I mean, you get in your car, you press the gas, you're breaking the law, right? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, since it's uh, international trading. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I have uh, my own hotel is on the design in San Bruno. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, but it takes really long, like the government sucks. And, uh, the government what? Sucks. Sucks, okay. <laughs> my, that's what I thought you said. <laughs> I just want to make sure I heard that right. <laughs> Yeah, I um, I go to a sushi place near uh, in Hayward. I live in Hayward. I'm born and raised in Hayward. I still live in Hayward. Uh, I went. My entire education is in the city of Hayward. I mean, I never really. Th my big move in life was to move seven miles to Castro Valley, which is right next to Hayward. But then I sold that house and moved back to Hayward. I got my 88-year-old dad living with me, and the house in Castro Valley was one story. And we were going to kill each other if we had to live on one story. And so he gets the downstairs, I get the upstairs. And uh, I can keep an eye on him that way. Um, but uh, I go to this uh, Japanese restaurant in Hayward all the time. And I start talking to the owner. And he's, oh, I have this yakitori stove, but I can't get it going because the government sucks. And they won't let me run the – and all of a sudden I'm sitting there. And he's like, I'm not going to do it, but I've already spent this much money. And I'm like, well, that's a sunk cost. Don't worry about the sunk cost. How much are you going to make? All of a sudden I'm sitting there getting an advising role, you know, half sloshed on sake, talking to this guy about what he should be doing. So – I'm sure it's pretty tough, but the good news is, I mean, if you hang with it, you stick with it, you're doing all the right things. Um, sometimes, you know, you do the right things, you don't get the right results. Your best bet is to keep doing the right things, and the right results will come, you know. So, okay, good. That all sounds great. That sounds like a lot of uh, hard but fun work, so, yeah. Good. Yeah. Right. Great. Hi. Hi, my name is Kitty Patel, but I have from Chagrin in Pam. Uh, my, my undergraduate is about marketing, but I moved to accounting because.
because I think I love the number and I used to study about the fundamental recording and I, I think I can do it well so I uh, changed my mind to choose accounting major and I have been here just only one year and four months so I everything is very new for me and I try to learn English language in the same time as I learn accounting here so I try so hard and uh, I try to study a lot and my my goal is I want to have a CPA exam and I, I, I want to find a job because uh, I want to have a new experience for me. Okay, great. Um, let me ask you, maybe I should add this to the um, to the outline for each person. How do you end up finding GGU? I, I'm, I'm curious. What? Uh, honestly, I find from Google. I do a research a lot. <laughs> and yeah, um, they have three universities that uh, I'm interested in. And it's famous about accounting. The one at uh, San Francisco State University. Mm -hmm. The second one, I, I, I not quite. Good. How about um, <coughs> any other thoughts on that? This I, w I was looking at colleges in the Bay Area because uh, I just moved here, um, and GGU was the only one that I didn't redo my GRE for the Masters in Counseling. Um, I was like, I worked really hard and got good grades in my undergrad. I don't want to give in to the government, not the government, but the, the, the man that says that you need GRE scores to get into a good college. Okay. Same kind of thing. Um, well, I just heard that a lot of, uh, all, all over the San Francisco, there's a uh, bunch of people who graduated from GGU, mm -hmm. so it's easy networking. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. So the alumni network? Is, yeah, pretty yeah. strong in San Francisco. Yeah. Okay. concentration here is taxation with masters in accounting. Uh, in India, I worked for a CPA for <coughs> about, about three years, and I started to. I mean, I wanted to do something in masters in taxation and accounting. Which and CPA firm? It was a private CPA firm. Uh -huh. Management company. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And the thing that attracted me to GGU was like there are many companies around GGU like Deloitte, PwC, KPMG. Mm -hmm. so my dream companies to work in, yeah. and I'm also a state national level player in volleyball and basketball. Oh, okay. In volleyball in, and basketball. in India or in the U.S. India. Oh, okay. okay. <coughs> I want to continue that after I finish my education. Yeah. You're gonna do what after you finish? I'm gonna continue playing sports after uh -huh. I finish education. After you finish. So do you like bend them like Beckham? Do you like that movie? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I did. <laughs> it's a good movie. I was like, uh, I have to watch it. I, I'm kind of the person that, if I like a movie, I watch it over and over and over again. Pretty soon, I'm like, you know, the annoying person that has all the lines of the yeah, different I things memorized. Must be an accounting thing. Right now, <laughs> the movie that I really like is a movie called Upgrade. It's about a guy who is paralyzed, and um, they give him a chip so that he can walk. It's a futuristic movie, so they give him a chip, he can walk, and then the chip starts talking to him and telling him <laughs> things that he should do to find the guys that killed his wife and all this thing, and the movie just goes from there. Um, and so I have a bad habit of I can't sleep in front of the TV unless there's something I really like on it, then I can fall asleep in front of the TV. So I put that on, but it gives me like these weird dreams. Is that action one that huh? came out recently? Yeah, it's called Upgrade. It's yeah, an yeah, action yeah. movie. It's uh, <laughs> it's a trip. It's pretty good. You know, so I'm starting to get all the lines memorized from that. But uh, okay, well, great. Hi. Hi everyone. My name is Arpit. I'm also basically from India, and I did my education in India. I did my graduation, like undergraduate and graduation in accounting in India. And then I moved here after my marriage, and uh, I'm 
the math program, and this is my fourth semester. Uh, I did my internship last semester at KPMG, and I did the full-time also, so I'm starting a full-time after graduation. Oh, great. Like, one more semester left, and then I'm starting my oh, full-time. Oh, congratulations. Uh, KPMG, uh, right over here on 2nd Street, yeah. is that where they are? Um, I kind of have a sense of the proximity of some of the firms because I used to go with Becker to talk to their interns about the CPA exam and stuff, you know, in a mark, kind of a marketing um, thing. And so I've been to most of the offices around. So that's great. That's great. And you're going to be in tax or uh, audit? audit? Okay. Okay, great. Pretty exciting. study for the CPA exam too and uh, I've worked with my family um, it's a trucking company small trucking company about 40 trucks I've worked for my mom okay great I, um, while I was finishing up school I worked for a trucking company um, in Hayward and uh, that was scary man they <laughs> they, they uh, their safety record left something to be desired. And so it happened to me like a couple times, really scary incidents. Like one time I'm in the back moving some of the stuff and the truck just starts taking off. <laughs> and I'm still in the back and I'm like, please God, don't let them get on the freeway. I'm in trouble. But uh, some guys that were on the dock saw what was happening and waved them down so I didn't get killed that time. And then uh, the other time, the real scary thing that happened was you know, <coughs> you drive the forklift into the truck to remove the pallets and stuff. But I guess they didn't secure the the uh, the trailer properly. And so when I drove the forklift in, the truck went, mm. And I'm like, okay. So I kind of like had to back out like I was carrying, you know, sticks of dynamite so the thing wouldn't, you know, tumble down with me in there. So um, but I'm sure your company is... Yeah. Yeah. Now, when we talk about compliance with laws and regulations, uh, part of what an auditor is required to do, you know, consider that. We consider the laws and regulations that have a direct impact on the financial statements. Okay. So, if we're talking about, say, let's use a trucking company <coughs> as an example, do you think an auditor has a responsibility to detect violations of law and, say, the OSHA safety laws? Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to say no. Okay. And it's a matter of judgment. A lot of what we're going to learn in this class is judgment prevails. Okay. But I'm going to say no because I don't think that those OSHA safety laws have a direct impact on the financial statements. Okay. Now, how about filing tax return? Is that a law that a company has to file the tax return? Absolutely, that's a law. And so if they didn't file the tax return, it's reasonable to expect that the auditor would detect that noncompliance with the law because I'm not sure how far you've gone in intermediate, but we do have the deferred tax liability. And in order to calculate the deferred tax liability, we have to understand, well, what have you – what is your tax liability? Well, let us see your tax return. Oh, gee, we didn't file it. It's reasonable that the auditor would detect that. So – uh, we'll talk more about that uh, down the road, but I figured since we were talking about safety and my experience with the lack thereof, I'd bring that up here. So there goes that example. Can't use that next time, although I am known to repeat myself. So. Well, my okay. company is fairly small. They don't, they don't really – well, I'm studying for the CPA exam, the audit exam. Mm -hmm. They don't really use an auditor or, you know, it's a small company. Right.
say the the internal control, the design implementation. Mm -hmm. Kind of notice that. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, if you're studying for the CPA exam, then I'm sure you're constantly saying to yourself on every engagement, the auditor has to obtain an understanding of the internal controls sufficient to evaluate the design of the controls and to determine if they have been implemented in order to make an assessment of control risk. And if you make an assessment of control risk at the maximum, then you move directly to substantive testing. But if you make an assessment of control risk at less than the maximum, then you'll have to test the operating effectiveness of the controls before moving to substantive testing. Yes. Right? <laughs> that is my chapter four or five of the Becker. <laughs> Becker well, that's Becker chapter, CPA, that's that's chapter three, but yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the CPA exam. We'll play that by ear. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit tonight, uh, just because the textbook does have some CPA exam. Um, information in chapter one so we'll see we can depending on what you guys want to do we can go a little deeper a little less than that um, tonight so uh, for you it's going to kind of be well yeah I know all this if you're already prepping for the exam do you know when you're going to sit I'm going to sit on June 5th June 5th oh okay yeah June 5th you can only test the first 10 days of the third month of each um, the uh, yeah the third month of each quarter so you got you got like the envious uh, date there that you were able to get that because there's only 10 days in June yeah. that you can sit. So I am, I, I'm from Tracy and I am sitting at Stockton. That's where my class is. So June 5th. What do you mean you're studying at Stockton? No, I'm um, sitting for the class. Oh, in Stockton. <laughs> in Stockton. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Well, when you're in Stockton, make sure you don't party too much in Stockton because <laughs> it's just, you know, it's a wild city, you know. Uh, I say that. I had a house in Stockton. Um, my whole family moved. We're, we're born and raised in Hayward. And then everybody decided to move to Stockton. Um, and so I'm like, well, I'm going to buy a house in Stockton too. But I lived in San Francisco. So I bought, I mean, I, I worked in San Francisco. So I bought this house in Stockton and I, you know, said, well, I'll get up at five in the morning and at four in the morning and I'll be on the road by five and I'll just zoom straight into San Francisco. Five o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting there stuck in traffic. I'm like, oh, <laughs> hell no. So I rented the house out and uh, and uh, got an apartment got another got back into the same complex I was in before before I bought the house and rented the house out for about six seven years until I recovered enough value so that I didn't take too much of a bath on the uh, on that one um, but my dad lived in Stockton uh, for almost 20 years and then what was happening, because he's 88 years old, he would call me up and say, somebody came in and turned all the lights on in the house. And I'm like, well, Dad, that was probably you. And you know, okay, if you're not going to help me, click. Hmm. So now I'm like sitting there. Maybe somebody did come in the house and turn on the lights on. So here I'm going 80 miles to find out that no, that nobody came in and turned all the lights on. So I finally persuaded him, Dad, you got to. You got to move in with me, so he finally he finally <coughs> agreed to that. But uh, he so I spent a fair amount of time in Stockton hanging out with my dad even after I sold the house. Um, so my brother still lives there. So <laughs> yeah, that's another thing. I melt in heat. Uh, I worked uh, for the federal government, as I said, for all those years, and Washington D.C. is. Awful. The reason government people are so mean is because they have to live in that humidity in Washington, D.C. It's the worst. It's in-your-face, oppressive humidity. Um, so, um, well, in Stockton, it's not quite that humid, but yeah. <laughs> how you doing? Well, my name is Faith. Uh, I started GQ here uh, with my MST, uh, finished that, and then thought I would you know, branch out and do a bit of accounting. So now I'm halfway through my uh, master's in accounting with tax concentration. Um, I work at Oracle doing sales tax audits. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, uh, I'm hoping to get.
get my CPA once I finish the degree, and uh, I'm hoping that accounting knowledge will add to my uh, tax experience. Oh, okay. Great. Um, so, do you deal with the, what is it, State Board of Equalization? Is that the sales tax auditors for the state of California, right? So they do all the um, audits of the sales tax returns, State Board of Equalization does. Yeah, um, not a bad gig to think about, I don't know to what extent any of you are pursuing government as an opportunity. I know some people who aren't, but uh, <laughs> and people that are. What's good about State Board of Equalization is you could be at Oracle one day, uh, the next day you're doing a 7-Eleven sales tax return. The next day you're doing um, Apple's sales tax return. And you're always connected up to the revenue cycle, obviously, with sales tax. So it's not a bad experience. Yeah. Great. Great, great. And Gigi, you, you found? Um, my friend is doing this. Your friend? I'm not going on to the school. I have a great resources for the students. Mm -hmm. And I'm working at the public office. Oh, okay. Awesome. Great. Any of you considered the, ever considered the cohort program? Have you heard about the cohort? Uh, if there's a cohort tax program that's going to start up this summer, um, and then, um, there's an accounting worth talking talking about potentially doing the accounting one uh, in the in January. Um, so something to think about. Um, what's nice about the cohort is you go through that. Usually, there's kind of a position sort of sitting there at the end because the firms tend to track the cohort. So, okay, great. You came from where? <coughs> Pennsylvania, you said? I graduated from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, uh huh. And, uh, and uh, I heard from, if I got a job in one of it, so I moved here and uh, work for the fund management and uh, fund management You live in Walnut Creek? No, I'm in San Francisco. Oh, okay. <coughs> okay. Yeah, Walnut Creek is nice too. I um, yeah, it's nice. I went shopping there the other day. Um, I was very <coughs> impressed that Main Street there, where all the stores are, and so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. What uh, are you from, Pennsylvania, or? Uh, no, I'm from China. Uh huh. And, and then you I went to Pennsylvania. Yeah, no, I, I have, because I'm doing all the program in the Pennsylvania, so over. I see. Okay. Hi. Hi, my name is Yu. Um, I graduated from San Francisco School for Psychology, and after I graduated psychology, I don't want anything to do with psychology. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sometimes the important thing in life is figuring out what you don't want to do, right? Why, why, what was wrong with it? Well, <coughs> part, of the, part of the program had to be six or six months internship. So I did, uh, and I, went, I did some short term, and then <coughs> there was a lot of problems, and I was taking it with me, I couldn't separate it, and oh. I figured out that I was not coming back. Yeah.
Okay. Okay. Great. <coughs> oh, okay. Good. Good. Awesome. Yeah, I um, mentioned, I don't know before, maybe some of you came in, that I was a housekeeper in the hospital. For, uh, I was there for seven years, believe it or not, as a housekeeper from the time I graduated high school till I finally started working for the federal government. And um, you see a lot in those places. So, um, you know, I knew the, the ironic thing was my parents wanted me to be a nurse. And because uh, I used to get like good grades in the biology classes in junior high because I have a good memory. So I could remember this is the vacuum or whatever you, know, <laughs> you have to do in a biology class. And uh, so they said, well, you should be a nurse. But I didn't want to be a nurse because I didn't want to deal with blood, that kind of thing. And so, you know, the cosmos has a way of setting all things straight. What do I end up? The guy that cleans the surgery rooms at the hospital, um, you know, but uh, you get some of those experiences. So, Okay, good. Well, that's great. That's good information, everyone. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to do that. What I want to do right now is um, take some time to sort of uh, show you e-learning and I'm going to try to move this thing I don't like the way they got me over in the corner over here um, see if I can do it without pulling all the cords out um, but I think you recognize e-learning okay and you can see the uh, course title etc um, I have a general module here uh, periodically I guess I'll put things up there like announcements that sort of thing uh, more general things. I wonder if I can get rid of this. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, and then you come down and the first module that you should be particularly interested in is syllabus. Okay. And so you click on obviously syllabus. Open it without giving me a hard time. Okay. Let's try that again. Well, we're off to a roaring start here. Is. Let's try it again. Okay. <coughs> well, it all worked beautiful when I was sitting there at my desk by myself. Okay, but let's go ahead. Let's click on it again. Okay, so much for that. Um, I will just open it from my desktop then since it doesn't want to open from here. Hopefully you'll be able to, uh, to open it. I'm not sure why it's fighting me. But theoretically, when you click on that, link theoretically it's supposed to open the syllabus okay and um, you can see the contact information for me uh, jlord at ggu.edu if you downloaded the syllabus a while back it may have had an AOL address there um, I would uh, suggest that you use the ggu address okay um, I do have a GGU phone number. I'm just going to give you my cell phone. I am going to forward the GGU phone to my cell phone. I mean, 
I don't know about you, but uh, landlines anymore just seem like I'm holding a dinosaur in my hand. I'm on the cell phone with everything now. So um, just call me on the cell phone. You can call that number pretty much uh, anytime. Uh, if you call it at 2 o'clock in the morning, I probably won't answer. If I do, I suggest you hang up because something terrible has gone wrong and I may ask you to come bail me out or something, okay? But uh, if you call and I don't answer, just leave voicemail. You can text, okay? And then uh, the email is hooked up to my phone as well, okay? Uh, office hours, right now, uh, you can find me up in the accounting office, 5300, okay? Is that the number up there on the fifth floor? 5300, you know where the accounting office is? So I'm just kind of will be hanging there. They've got me perching off the side of somebody's desk right now. Uh, but once I get an office set up and stuff, I can give you more details as the office number. But it's that bullpen of the accounting offices on the fifth floor of 5300. It'll be just before this class. Um, for the first couple of classes, guys, I'm going to just be making it in time uh, to start class because I'm wrapping up my um, accounting class at San Francisco State, which gets out on Tuesdays at 5, at 4, 5, 4.45. So I'm jumping in my car and coming over here. I should be here pretty close to 5.45, but uh, if you don't see me, text me. I'll let you know, hey, I'm stuck in traffic, whatever it is. And that's going to only be, in fact, that counts, includes today. So it's really next time is the only time that that would affect, and then I'll just be coming straight from my house over here. So it shouldn't be a problem after that. Okay. Uh, in fact, I'll be here all day on Tuesdays, um, so you can pretty much catch me anytime. So if you want to set an appointment, um, you can do that. Okay. Um, first day of class, last day of class. Okay. Course description. We're going to talk a little bit more about what auditing is all about. Uh, what I will tell you is we're going to spend most of our time talking about financial statement auditing. Now there are other types of audits that you can be involved in and we'll sprinkle on those a little bit and there are engagements that are different than audit um, such as compliance um, I, said, I should say compilations and reviews we'll touch on those towards the end of the class but the real core of this class is financial <laughs> statement auditing okay we'll talk about some of the objectives of that tonight okay um, after completing this course you will understand what the responsibilities are of auditors. You will understand some of the key uh, terminologies that auditors use. You will understand some of the audit procedures that auditors use. You will understand the reporting requirements uh, for auditors. Okay, so you're going to get a good sense of that. Now, auditing is a practical class. So unlike a lot of, say, your accounting classes where we're talking about, well, this is what the standards say, and here's practicing using, you know, some uh, homework assignments and some quiz questions, auditing is more something where I recommend you picture yourself doing the procedures, okay? Auditors are in the field actually conducting procedures, and so a lot of times I'm going to be asking you to picture how you would be doing that. I'll bring in examples. When I say bring in, I'll provide examples of my own experiences implementing some of these procedures, et cetera. So it's a little different than some of your other classes where you can kind of sit there and, you know, you don't have as much of an actual practical component. Auditing is an actual living, breathing uh, discipline, and so uh, we'll use a lot of examples in here. Okay, I think most of you understand the uh, requirements for the degrees here. Okay, if there are questions, you can certainly reach out to me about the requirements that you're meeting uh, for your degrees, but we do provide that link here for you. Okay, course material. Uh, this is the textbook. Okay, it's the seventh edition. Is it in the bookstore? Did anybody see it? <coughs> yes. It is in the bookstore? Did you get a price on that? Did you get a number of that truck? I found 300, but I didn't need to. Oh, hell no. I was just like, no, no. 300? It was like three something. Yeah, it was a used one. I was like, I was going to rent the book or whatever. It was pretty nice. Well, that is the code. I think the code is the expensive one. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Um, 
All right, let's 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 break this down. Let's talk about this right now. Okay. Um, what I have, let me see if I can click on this. If I can open this, open hyperlink. Let's see what happens. Welcome. It wants me to log in, right? Oh, I see. This is this is what it'll look like when you go to log in. Okay. And there's a um, there's a 14 day trial period that you can get it for free. Okay, so you go and you follow that link that's in the syllabus. You open it the way I did. Provide them your information, your email, etc. But don't buy anything. Don't give them your credit card. Okay. And what you'll be able to do is log in and see what I'm about to show you. That I'm going to just go in through my through my login to show you what's in there. Okay. And so. Let me open a new browser. Oh, I already have it open. Beautiful. Okay, so when you get in there, you will see the assignments. In fact, let me do this. Home. Ah. I'm going to go to student view. Okay. And each chapter will have homework and will have a quiz. Okay. Now, when you click on those, and you'll be able to do this after you register for free, you will see the homework. And we're going to go through this tonight. And typically what I'll do is I'll go through the homework with you, item by item. I'll go through the quiz with you, item by item. Okay. And that's going to be the primary thing that you will get out of Connect is the homework and the quizzes that I set up in there. Um, now you can also get, you can also access the ebook. <laughs> Okay, so you don't have the have the hard copy of the book, you can get the ebook. So I think the ebook with the connect code, when you do it that way, costs you something like a hundred and forty something dollars or something like that. Huh? Who said that? Huh? Bought it how? Huh? Yeah, 137 with the with the ebook. So, huh? Yeah, and that includes the ebook when you go through it for 137. Um, I'm not sure what you bought because um, you wanted to follow that link to this specific class. Okay, but yeah, you can go ahead and do it for 137, right? When you follow that, and then if you add the loose leaf version of the book. It's another forty dollars or so, so or maybe sixty dollars. That's where I'm coming up with that one ninety number, the one thirty seven plus the forty or sixty. So you could have a loose leaf book with the ebook. Can you take that thing back that you have? No, no. Okay, but I, I will tell you that, that thing. Huh? I want to confirm with you because I didn't open that SAS code on that thing. So can you can take it back? Yeah. So it depends. If you want the hard cover book then maybe you keep that and when you log in you put in the access code but you have to go here to get it okay but it's going to be homework assignments like this and the ebook okay now what I'm thinking is because if you look at this quiz and this homework it's going to typically be about 10 questions that I'm going to give you for each one of those and I don't know that even 137 is worth 10 questions uh, when I'm going to be giving you the slides. I've already shown you, I'll show you in a minute where I posted the slides. I'll post the slides. 
We'll have the lectures there. And so my challenge is going to be how do I disseminate the quizzes and the homework um, to you? Okay. Now what I could do is put up Word files with these quiz and homework questions so I could select them from like the test bank and that will be our quizzes and our homework will be questions that I'll pull from the test bank and then we'll work those together using the word files and then we'll um, you know we'll bypass having to get connect the problem that I have with that is that then gives you a thin set of material because I can't distribute the whole test bank to you guys. It wouldn't be appropriate. We're going to talk about ethics in here. Ethically, I can't just disseminate all of McGraw-Hill's materials that they expect you to pay for. Now, what I could do, some of you already have this, I could talk to Becker and ask them to provide us one part of the CPA exam material, a Becker CPA exam material, which would be obviously the auditing part. And then we could supplement our material with that. So we would study some of the questions that Becker has as CPA review questions. The only difficulty there is the chapters don't necessarily line up the way we're looking at them. Like chapter one is talking about audit reports, and we're not going to get into audit reports until much later. So um, you might have a disconnect between something you're looking at in the Becker material and what we're actually talking about in class. Um, I turn it to, to you. Thoughts? Huh? Um, no, I mean I can no, I don't have like a PDF or something in the book. No, all all I have is the same thing you have, which is the ebook. If you if you were to get this say this one thirty seven thing, it comes with the ebook. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd rather have like a lot of material, you know, because it's too thin. I feel like I won't learn anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 That's fine. Um, let me um, think about how I can get, because I still have to assign the homework uh, to you in order for you to be able to access it. If I don't assign it, you can't get into it. Um, so I'm going to have to figure out a way to um, make as much of that as available to you as possible so that you're getting, because I don't want it to be limited to the uh, few things that I select. I think that you should be able to get all of the questions, but let me see how I can uh, how I can work that on the homework end if there's some way I can click on everything so it's all there and then um, what I, the way I set up the homework and connect is you get credit for the homework as long as you go in and do it okay so in, in other words you could click on all the wrong answers and you get the points for it so the homework and the quiz points that we're going to talk about since we're going to work the homework and the quizzes together are kind of give me points Okay, I'm just going to give those to you as long as you're here and you're participating and that sort of thing. So I will always have homework and quiz that will cover together. And then I'm going to work on making everything in Connect available to you. And that will make the 137 or whatever it is you paid worth the cost then. Okay, so we'll do it that way. Would it be the same questions that you give us available? Uh, I don't know to what extent um, they line up the questions in Connect with the questions in the book. Um, what I can do, you asked if I have a soft copy of the textbook. I'm pretty sure I have a soft copy of the solutions 
so I can put the solutions to all the homework so and that does line up with the book so anything that's in the book is you know the solutions will be there as well so I can post those so that you have those and then you can work select questions from the back of the chapter you know and work as many of those as you want okay but what I'll be doing is I'll be selecting specific questions from the homework from the quiz we'll work those together that'll be relatively light relatively thin but then what I'll also do is I'll assign a huge homework assignment which will allow you to go in and access all of the uh, homework questions okay so that you get more bang for your buck that way okay and I'll talk to Becker about getting this one part free too just so you have that too because they like to do that anyway so we'll see if we can work that okay so when you sign up for the course whether you're using your um, connect code that you already have or you're going and doing this you apparently clicked on that and they're asking for your credit card and stuff go in make sure you're following that link though because if you just go in generically it's not going to take you to this class so you've got to follow that specific link that I just opened up in the syllabus question no okay good all right so we'll look at this uh, homework questions tonight uh, we should have time to look at those a little bit later all right let me try again to work in e-learn well no let me not try again we already figured that out that's not going to work so let's continue through the syllabus is there a question guys no okay all right good is there a question something not opening or something I'm sorry I'm sorry Don't worry about that. That's not. I don't see why that's relevant. Select anyone you want. I don't know why they're doing that. That's irrelevant. Doesn't matter. Yeah, if you want to just stand, I don't know. They they do certain little things um, that you don't have to worry about. Select any of one of those that you want. Um, which one did you? So how did you get to? I see, I see, but you got to follow that link, right? Yeah. yeah. Make sure you follow that link. Okay. All right. Uh, and, and what uh, they were saying was they saw some other schools that I've taught or teach at. Sometimes the, the, um, they have a representative <laughs> that gets involved and sets things up. Um, I've learned the hard way that these representatives are almost useless. And so I just go ahead and set it up myself in there. So even though you don't see GGU there, you can still click on any of those. It's okay. As long as you follow that link. Okay. Okay, good. Um, I guess the bookstore is not going to be happy with us because we're not going to pay them $300 when we can pretty much get the whole thing for a couple hundred, right? Okay. All right, good. Uh, I think you know where the library is. I don't know that there's particular tutoring for this class, um, so I guess I'm your tutor, okay? If you have questions, whatnot, you know who to talk to. Um, disability resources, please let me know if you have any issue there. Wellness resources. The best way to contact me is whatever, phone, email, whatever. <coughs> Okay, guys, I'm going to kind of ask that um, that you not talk while I'm talking. That's kind of one of my pet peeves. So if you have something that you want to contribute to the whole class, that's fine. Otherwise, you know, kind of keep it down to a mild roar if you don't mind. Okay. Attendance, participation, I expect you to be here. Um, obviously, if you have to miss something, um, you can talk to me about that. Okay, quizzes and homework are pretty much um, 
give me points as long as you're here and we work those quizzes and homework together. I'm assuming that you've got the that you've worked the quiz, you worked the homework, and I just give you the points for that. Okay. Uh, when I see somebody that starts missing class a lot, then I might start to say, hey, if you want the homework and quiz points, you need to have more consistent attendance. Okay. You miss one class, two classes. I'm not going to trip, you know, and you know, blow a gasket. But if someone blows off the attendance, then I start, you know, kind of get after you a little bit. Okay. So just make sure you're here. Um, most of the points come from the examination. Okay. Now something that I'm working on with you all heard of Moss Adams CPA firm. Okay. I'm trying to get them to put together a class project for us, which will involve using data analytics and um, using um, some software that they will be giving us access to, et cetera, and maybe even having some of their staff come over and coach us on that, that kind of thing. But because I wasn't able to get that together in time to have it appropriately described here, we'll do, we'll make that extra credit. Okay, so once that gets rolling, we'll go ahead and we'll decide, okay, we're going to make this 10 points, 20 points, extra credit, whatever, that will contribute to, you know, your grade. Okay, so I'm still working on that. Um, I want them to try it with this class first and what I'd like them to do is make it a broader part of the overall accounting program that we embed something like that in maybe all of our classes so that uh, data analytics is something we'll talk about a little bit in this class. Data analytics is more and more CPA firms are expected to take large chunks of their clients data. Sometimes all of the clients data in a particular area. So rather than using sampling, you'll take the entire universe of data and because of the computing power that's available now, you can actually make decisions using all of the data and help your clients to make um, you know better business decisions and auditors are being expected to do more of that. So I'm going to work with Moss Adams to see if I can get them to uh, sponsor something like that for us where they're giving us access to some of their uh, software and that kind of stuff and maybe having some of their staff come over and help us with some of that. They're right down the street. Moss Adams is right down here on Mission Street, so it shouldn't be too hard for them to get over here. Okay. Okay, any question on that? The grading? You can see the breakout of grades. Okay, pretty standard. Shouldn't be anything surprising there. Okay. Uh, I don't grade on a curve. It's a straight Percentage, grade, I'll give all A's in here. I do not have a problem giving 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 A pluses. I don't care. It is my opinion that I am here to help you to learn something about auditing and get a good grade in the process. I'm not interested in seeing anybody down in these, and I don't have... Uh, I don't have a set number of B's or whatever that I give. So I'll give all A's. Okay. Um, that's why I don't like teaching at UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley says that I cannot give more than an average 3.4 GPA in a class like this. So I have to start creating winners and losers. If you're getting an A plus, you got to get a B minus to average that out. I don't like that. I don't like that because then all of a sudden I have to start putting impossibly hard questions on the exams that you can answer maybe because you read every you know footnote in the book. You're sitting there saying, what the F was that? And to me, it's a failure in teaching if a student walks out of an exam and says, I have no idea why that was on the exam, et cetera. So my uh, belief is that we're going to study these things. We're going to work hard. I'm going to show you what I'm going to put on the exam. And then that's what's going to be on the exam. And there's no reason why, not the same exact questions, but similar questions. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to come in and kill these exams. Okay. Question. What? Um, CPA exam does have a curve element to it. Okay, so passing on the CPA exam, as you know, is 75. Um, 
for, e for each part. you got to get 75 or better on each part to pass it. And the entire exam is machine graded. A computer grades the exam. So multiple choice questions are either right or wrong. And when you get to task-based simulations, okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about how the exam is structured, those are either, to the most part, right or wrong. However, they do give you credit for carry-through errors. So if you make a mistake up here, they won't penalize you if you get another number wrong because of a mistake you made higher up. But everything is machine graded, including your writing, which is on the BEC part of the exam. Then they do have a curve element in there, but it starts to get into, you know, artificial intelligence type curving, that sort of thing that really I would not bother yourself with. Yeah. So it's not a straight percentage. No, there is a curving element. It's all machine graded. Everything now is machine graded. Yeah, you can ask for a manual regrade. I don't recommend it. So obviously no one asks for a manual regrade if you pass. But if somebody doesn't pass the exam, you can ask for a manual regrade. I have never had an experience where someone says, guess what? I went for the manual regrade and my 70 became a 75. So, okay. Okay, good. Questions? I kind of already gave you my bio. We're going to do chapter one tonight and so on. Usually it'll be about one chapter per week. Note the dates of the exams, guys. I put those in red. Okay. Um, I know that you guys are much more mature than my undergraduate students who kill their grandparents on the days of the exams who have a family emergency that comes up on the day of the exams, okay? I know you're not going to do that. Mark the days of the exams and, you know, plan accordingly. They're all in red. We will do the final exam. Final exam is not comprehensive. So it will be really like three midterms, 100 points each. Is it open book? No. What class is that? Tax is open book. When I taught tax, it's open book. They can bring whatever they want in with them uh, for tax. Um, accounting is a closed book subject. And, of course, CPA exam is closed book, right? But, um, yeah, tax, yeah. I, I let my students, when I taught the one tax class that I've taught, I let them bring in the materials. The only thing they couldn't bring in was the test bank. I I distributed the te whole test bank to that class. And the reason I did is because I was teaching the old tax law. And it's going away. So <laughs> I dumped the entire test bank on them so they could go in there and play around in the test bank. But I didn't allow them to bring the test bank into the test because then they could look up, you know, the specific question that was on the exam. But other than that, I let them bring everything. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. The tests are going to be easy. Oh, format for the test. I'm thinking 20 multiple choice questions. It'll be similar to these quiz and homework questions that we're going to look at tonight. And one free response type question. Does that sound fair? Yes. Okay. So 20 multiple choice questions and a free response question I think is fair. And we'll take the whole class time. I don't like to lecture before exams. I don't like to lecture after exams. Because if I'm lecturing before exams, everyone's sitting there going, I have to remember the assertions. I don't know anything that he's saying right now. If I lecture after the exam, everyone's sitting there going, I wonder what the answer to number 23 was. Okay, so rather than waste our time, we'll spend the whole time doing the test. And it should be that the uh, uh, amount of time we have available for the class is plenty of time to work these exams. Okay? 
Questions? Concerns? Were you able to get into McGraw-Hill? You gave up after I said stop doing that? <laughs> Were you able to get in? No? Yes? Okay. Okay, good. Okay, guys. I'm thinking um, we take a quick break. And um, if there are questions, concerns that you need to speak to me about, I'll be here for what? You want to do 10 minutes or 15 minutes? 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay, good. So we'll do 10 minutes. So we'll come back a little bit after 8.20, and um, we'll see if we can knock out Chapter 1, okay? The slides for Chapter 1. Slides for Chapter 1 are posted on e-learning under Chapter 1, okay? Is that your sister's wedding thing, right? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't um, contradict with an exam. Is only would be my only concern there. Okay. Is that right? Yeah, I think the next time I'm in class we have a midterm, but I'll, I'll be able to study on the plane and everything. Okay. Yeah, just uh, keep me posted, reminded okay. on that, yeah. just so I don't say where are you, where is it? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I can like, send you an email the day I leave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank, All right. Thank, you. thank you. Yeah. Appreciate. It. Okay, um, I'm a little behind on posting the slides up, so I'm hoping that uh, this weekend you'll see more of the slides coming up there. And um, I think we will go with me selecting quiz and homework questions and putting them up in a Word file as well as setting those up in um, Connect for you. And I'll also do the thing where I'll set up the whole as much as I can, as much as it'll let me. Sometimes they cut you off as much as it'll let me. So I got to get some of that together. So for right now, though, we should be good that you got the slides for Chapter 1. You got the quiz and the homework set up and connect for Chapter 1, and we'll go through those tonight. And then you can, your homework assignment, I guess, will be reading through the chapter and uh, getting the book and that kind of stuff, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and uh, let's take a look, though, at uh, some of these slides, okay? And um, we're going to have learning objectives here, okay? Primary one is going to be number three here, describing what assertions are all about, okay? We're going to see that uh, financial statements are made up of assertions, and when auditors audit financial statements, we're not auditing assets, liabilities, revenues, no, no. We look at it that we are auditing financial statement assertions, okay? So it's going to be key that we know what the assertions are, and that's just going to be a list of what the assertions are. But the most important thing that you can take from this class is knowing how to audit the assertions, okay? I tell my, uh, new um, auditors, if you don't know why you're doing an audit procedure, you're not doing your job. If you don't know why you're doing a particular procedure, then you're not doing your job. And the procedures that we talk about will always tie back to the assertion. Okay? So when you're doing a procedure, you should always be able you should always ask yourself what assertion. Okay? We're going to talk about some basic things such as professional skepticism, which is more a state of mind than anything. We'll talk about public accounting firms, which I think you um, all know that. We'll talk about different roles of auditors, government, internal. And uh, then towards the end, we've already been talking about it a little bit, but uh, since the book decided to go ahead and put something about the CPA exam, CPA designation in here, I'll walk through that. Uh, depending on how you guys feel, I can walk you through what the requirements are in California to sit for the exam to get the license. We can do that. Uh, and I can talk to you a little bit how the exam is structured, talk about some timing issues on the exam, uh, that sort of thing. And that should pretty much take us up to uh, the end of class and maybe uh, have time to do the quiz. What time do we get out of here? Nine. Really? You guys pull my leg? I thought it was 
No, 9.30? Okay. Uh, I'm not one to drag a class out. You know, if we get out a little early, I'm not going to cry. Okay, so we'll figure it out. If we don't finish this today, we'll pick it up next time. Okay, so you say 9.30? <coughs> okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay. All right, good. So let's go ahead and take a look at demand for reliable information. And we have this notion of information risk. Information risk is the risk that the information that investors and creditors use to make investment and credit decisions will be inaccurate, will be misleading, false. Okay. And so to help with that, users, and they say users demand uh, a third party verification of information, which is what the auditor is going to do. Now, they say users demand as though, you know, users of information sit there and say, hmm, I want a third party involved. Look, this is a system that was established in the 30s after the crash of the stock market you create the Securities Exchange Commission and the SEC has the authority the, receives the responsibility to do what to make sure that investors and creditors aren't getting harmed from this kind of information so our f government fans you have the SEC the federal government getting involved and in saying this is how we'll make sure that there's reliable information in the hands of investors right so I don't know that investors are necessarily sitting sick hammering. Where is my third party assessment of the information and that there's a structure that provides that kind of assurance on the information. Okay. Now, having said that, there are potentials where there is a user of the financial information that will ask for third party that is not necessarily part of regulations. For example, if you're going to give a loan, a bank will often sit there and say, well, we want some sort of third party verification of that information, even though you're not a public company. And even though it's a transaction between the bank and the company, the bank may be ones that request that. So you sort of have this structure pushing this whole thing, but you could have situations outside of that structure where, yes, a user could ask for some sort of third party verification. Okay. So we have this information risk. All right. Now, you can see that we have our financial statements, balance sheet, income statement, statement of cash flows, footnotes. You don't know how good it feels for me to sit here and call out those financial statements to you, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because I teach introductory to accounting, and when I say, where is cash? And someone says, on the income statement. Ah, don't ever say that again. So you know what the financial statements are. You know that they contain what? Different accounts, balance sheet, has assets, liabilities, stockholders' equity, our income statement, revenue, expenses, net income, statement of cash flows, explaining the difference between net income and cash provided by operations, right? These days, ton of footnote disclosures, right? And uh, every day it seems like they add additional footnote disclosures that make these financial statements uh, useful, okay? Now, or understandable is probably a better term to uh, talk about here. Now, what happens is management is responsible. The financial statements are management's responsibility. Let's write that in. Management is responsible for the financial statements. Guys, my writing is horrid. I have the worst handwriting you have ever seen. When I was a boy, the teacher sent notes home. John cannot stay inside the lines. And I kept thinking someday my writing would get better, and it's only gotten worse. I have a neuropoly. I can't feel this finger. I can't feel this side of my ring finger on my writing hand. It's numb, numb on this side. So I go to the doctor, and I say, well, this finger is numb, and this side of the finger is numb. So they put me through these tests where they start shocking my arm, and the readings come back. Ow, ow, 
the readings come back and they hand me a piece of paper that says you have this and in the picture the guy's small finger and this side of the ring finger were blacked out i said well i told you that's what i have why did you have to shock my finger to tell to shock my arm to tell me that that's what i have okay now uh so because i know that i have all these problems okay i always call out what i'm writing so you are best off to sort of use the, your ears to hear what I'm saying. So I'm saying management. I'll say management, management, management's responsibility. And all I'm doing when I'm writing it is kind of give you an idea of where to write it. Okay? Okay. So the financial statements are management's responsibility. I can't spell either management's responsibility okay the auditor's responsibility is to provide an opinion on the financial statements as to whether or not they were prepared in accordance with and in accordance with the applicable framework. In most of our discussions, it'll be U.S. GAAP. U.S. GAAP. In most of the cases, it'll be U.S. GAAP, okay, the applicable framework in most of our discussions. However, you know that international financial reporting standards are out there, okay? Many countries use IFRS, the U.S does not. U.S. does not. U.S. uses U.S. GAAP. Okay? Um, there was a time when they said, it's not a question of if, but when the United States will go over to IFRS. They used to say that all the time, like around the early 2000s, 2002 time frame, 2003 time frame. And I worked for the federal government for all those years, and I thought to myself, nothing in the federal government works that way. If the SEC turned to all the companies and said, you must switch over to U.S. GAAP. They would go to Congress, in fact, they did go to Congress and say, wah, if you switch to IFRS, the terrorists have won. They'll say whatever they need to to stop it from happening. And they were successful in that. Okay. Now, why did the U.S. companies want not want to go over to IFRS? Well, let's think for a second. Why would a set of international standards even be helpful? Why would a set of international standards be helpful? Yeah, right? It helps me with my comparability, right? I'm trying to decide, do I want to buy United Airlines stock or do I want to buy Emirate Airlines stock? Well, Emirate Airlines is going to use IFRS because they are headquartered in United Arab Emirates, which has adopted IFRS. U.S. is still on U.S. GAAP. Now, I can tell you probably buy the Emirate stock because that airline is beautiful. I mean, everything on that thing is tip top, okay, compared to um, – United is okay, but Emirates is better, okay? All right, but anyway, just from a passenger standpoint. So how can I compare them if they're using two different sets of accounting standards, right? So the idea was U.S. would adopt IFRS. Now we improve that comparison. Why would the U.S. companies go to Congress and stop this from happening? too much work and too much money and that they're going to have to convert their accounting systems from a what? From a U.S. based uh, gap systems to IFRS based systems, right? Okay, they didn't want to incur that cost. There's also parts of IFRS that U.S. companies don't like. For example, under IFRS, you can't use the last in first out inventory method. It is not allowed under IFRS. So what happens? If you adopt IFRS, you can't use last in first out. In periods of rising prices, LIFO will give you what? A lower net income, won't it? 
Now, there's a LIFO conformity rule in the tax rules that if you use LIFO for, uh, if you are going to use, if you don't use LIFO for financial reporting purposes, you can't use it for tax purposes. So if we got rid of it because we switched our IFRS, you can't use it for tax purposes. If you have a higher net income for tax purposes, you pay more income tax, don't you? Do companies like to pay income tax? No, they don't. So they went and said, no, don't switch to over to IFRS. That's probably one of the major things they didn't like about it. Okay. All right. So you have a bunch of different things that really made uh, companies not like IFRS. So the U.S. never adopted it. Okay. So U.S. number one economy is the U.S. economy. Maybe number two is China, maybe number one is China, number two is the United States, depending on what indicators you look at. They're 1A, 1B on any given day, okay? Has China adopted IFRS? Has China adopted IFRS? If you look at the statements from the Ministry of Finance, they say we've adopted IFRS. But when you go to China and you talk to Chinese accountants, they say, well, not quite. What they, that's the official position, but what they've done is they've cherry-picked parts of IFRS that they like. In other areas, they've maintained China Gap. For example, in IFRS, you can write your fixed assets up above historical cost. China did not adopt that. China still uses historical costs for accounting for their fixed assets. So what happened? IFRS didn't get the U.S. They didn't get China. They didn't get the number one in two economy. So where IFRS's star was rising in the early 2000s, it has kind of waned quite a bit now. Uh, these days, and I saw a comment from the chairman of the International Accounting Standards Board, the body that sets IFRS, and they said, well, at least we have the rest of the world. I'm like, what are you going to do, bleed on us? I mean, you didn't get the U.S., you didn't get China. I mean, you know, you kind of lost out on two big ones right there. Okay, so um, even in the CPA exam, the financial section does have some IFRS, but if you start to look at the blueprints for what's on that part of the CPA exam, they have backed off. On, uh, on how much they're pushing IFRS now, okay? So, of course, for U.S. GAAP, we have the FASB. For IFRS, we have the International Accounting Standards Board, okay? But these are applicable frameworks, and the auditors will come in, and they will look at those financial statements to see that they were prepared in accordance with these applicable frameworks, right? Okay, now the auditor is going to be independent, okay, and is going to provide uh, is going to perform certain audit procedures and look at evidence to support this opinion report. Okay, so evidence is going to support that opinion. Okay, now what I want to do right now is take a look at, I always have this dilemma, do I keep it or do I discard it? I say I keep it, because who knows when I'll have those genius thoughts again, right? Okay, all right, <laughs> so what I want to do right now is look up, have you ever heard of this company called Apple? <laughs> okay, I'm going to look up Apple's 10K report. Okay, now 10K, as you're probably familiar, for the SEC, it's a government <laughs> form, essentially, and 10K is the annual report. Okay, now you also have 10Q, is the quarterly report, etc., right? So you kind of get through some of this gobbledygook here, huh? Where's my hyperlinks? Okay, this isn't the one I want. Let me go back. Oh, 
Oh, there it is. Select a year. I'm going to go with 2018 so we can get the annual report. Okay, and uh, yeah, let's open up the PDF. Okay, and I'm going to go <coughs> to the R's report. Now, look, we're going to get to the audit report at the end of the class, okay? And we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at this audit report, understanding how we change the audit report if different things happen, et cetera, okay? But just looking at what we see here, we have the report of independent registered accountant. We want to be independent of the company so that we have that third-party relationship, right, that will provide some reliability to the financial reports, okay? Now, when we look... We say, in our opinion on the financial statements, we have audited the company balance sheet, statement of operations as the income statement, statement of comprehensive income. You can either combine that with your income statement or have a separate statement. I guess Apple chose to have a separate comprehensive income statement. Our stockholders' equity in the statement of cash flows for the period ended December, 30, uh, December 29th. 2018 and the related notes okay in our opinion the financial statements present fairly in all material respects the financial position of apple inc at december 29 2018 and the results of operations etc so notice we are coming right out at the very beginning and saying in our opinion this is what these financial statements do that's why they call it an opinion okay they complied with the U.S. generally accepted accounting principles, Apple being a company that obviously wants to list in the U.S., has to follow the U.S. standards, right? Okay. Now, we come down and we have to put in there that we also uh, audit in accordance with the public company accounting oversight board rules, Apple's internal control over financial reporting. We're going to talk about Sarbanes-Oxley. And what Sarbanes-Oxley did in Section 404 of Sarbanes is require that companies that audit the financial statements also do an audit of the company's internal controls. Okay? Prior to 2002 Sarbanes-Oxley Act, companies would sometimes just move straight to testing without looking at the internal controls because it's more efficient to do so. So uh, you have WorldCom, you have Enron come down, Congress gets upset, and they say, you know what? From now on, when you go in and you audit the financial statements, you will look at the internal controls. And this is in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and Section 404 says you will give an opinion on those internal controls. So we have two things. We're giving the opinion on the financial statements, the opinion on internal controls. Now, we say basis for our opinion. And they tell us that these financial statements are the responsibility of who? Management. They're the responsibility of management. The financial statements are not the responsibility of the auditor. Financial statements of management. Our responsibility is to express an opinion on Apple's financial statements based on our audits. Okay, we are a public accounting firm registered with the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board and required to be independent with respect to Apple in accordance with U.S. federal securities laws, applicable rules and regulations of the U.S. Security Exchange Commission, and the PCAOB. Okay, PCAOB, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, is an entity that was created by Sarbanes. And Sarbanes, Sarbanes, Oxley, who's Sarbanes, who's Oxley? Who's Sarbanes? Who's Oxley? 
Good. Sarbanes was the senator, Democrat. Oxley was a House member, Republican. And that, back in those days, that's when they would get together to fix things when things went wrong. Now they just sit there and go, ah, ah, ooh, ah, ooh. right? That's Trump's hair. Okay. <laughs> that's what they do now. So Sarbanes Oxley comes down and says, hey, you're, we're going to create the PCAOB. PCAOB is going to look at you. Accounting firms, you have to register, and we're going to look at you to see that you're doing the job correctly. Because what? One of the problems with Enron was that Arthur Anderson, may they rest in peace, right, was what? Was complicit in some of the problems. So we create the PCAOB to look over. And the other thing that happened in Sarbanes, it made it very clear that the SEC has the authority to set auditing standards. Prior to that, there was some ambiguity in the laws to whether or not the SEC had even had the authority to set the accounting, uh, excuse me, the auditing standards for uh, public companies. And so Sarbanes made that very clear. So remember those kids that I told you about decided that they want to be accountants when they're two? Okay, rather than playing in the swimming pool and going Marco Polo, those kids go Sarbanes Oxley, Sarbanes Oxley. Okay, that's a joke. Okay, note to self, they like the timing, they don't like the timing of that joke. I'll leave that one behind next time. Okay, so we have the Sarbanes-Oxley Act creates PCAOB. We conduct our audit in accordance with those standards. PCAOB is the standard setter for uh, doing these audits, and we'll be learning about their requirements. We'll also learn about the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. If you're a non-public company that's being audited, then your auditor follows the AICPA standards. Now, as a reality, what the AICPA does is they go and they say, well, we're going to issue a new standard. We want to issue a new standard. And they go to PCAOB and they say, does this look okay to you? Please don't strike me dead if you don't like it. Because they know that if they're not close to what the public requirements are, they're going to be sort of obsolete here pretty quick, aren't they? Okay, so to a large extent, PCAOB points to the AICPA standards and says, follow that, and we'll tell you when we want you to do something different. Okay, so for the most part, we'll learn the AICPA requirements, and then we'll sprinkle on top of that what the PCAOB specific requirements are. For example, providing an opinion on the internal control. If you're auditing a non-public company, you do not have to provide that opinion on internal control. That is only under the PCAOB requirements. Okay, but we'll talk more about these reports, et cetera, later. Okay, now notice that the standards require that we plan and perform the audit to obtain reasonable assurance. Reasonable assurance, very key phrase, reasonable assurance. We do not provide absolute assurance. Why? We're only human, right? We make, you guys heard that song, right? Born to make mistakes. We make mistakes, don't we? Okay, we're human. What else? So we might make a mistake. We might miss something. Sorry, it happens. What else? Well, the opinion is based, based on evidence, and we don't have 100% evidence, so we're going to use sampling and that kind of thing. Imagine you're auditing McDonald's. What are you going to You've seen the signs, billions and billions. I mean, how are you going to audit all them hamburgers, right? And so what happens? We have to use sampling, and there's always a chance that our sample will not be representative of the true population, right? Okay, what else? Exactly. Exactly. Although we like to think that auditors can jump out of a 10-story window and fly, that's not the case. And so there's always a chance that what? Somebody in the company, management, whatever, employees are slicker than the auditor. Sorry. Okay. So for those reasons, okay, we only provide reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free of Material misstatement. We are not looking for two cent errors. 
we are looking for material misstatement. What makes a misstatement material? Think from the standpoint of the users, the users of the financial reports. What would happen to the users if some of the things that you described happened? There was a big mistake in the financial statements. The, for example, investors, they would lose money if, they, if there's something wrong with the financial statement. Of course, the company is going to come. They would lose money because they would make an investment decision that was incorrect, right? So a material fact is one that could change the decision of the user of the financial statements, right? And I want you to think it in those terms instead of big dollar amounts because you could have a smaller dollar amount that could still change the decision to buy the stock, okay? So let's use big dollar amount. If I had known the financial statements were misstated by $25 million, I would have never bought your stock. Huge number, change the decision. If I had known that your uh, financial statements were misstated by $25,000 because of management fraud, I would have never bought your stock. Dollar amount has come down, but now the qualitative aspects of that misstatement have made that a material misstatement. So when we think about materiality, we have to think in terms of what? Yes, quantitative, but also what? Qualitative aspects as well. Okay? Okay, good. Good. <laughs> and we say material misstatement, whether caused by error or fraud. Error is accidental. Fraud is intentional, right? Okay? Okay, good. We are going to examine evidence on a test basis. We're not going to audit every single transaction. On a test basement regarding the amounts of disclosure in the financial statements, our audit also include evaluating the accounting principles used and significant estimates made by management. Do financial statements have estimates in them? They are full of estimates, right? And we're going to evaluate those estimates, okay? And then we signed the report. This so happened to be Ernst & Young, and Ernst & Young is one of the big four accounting firms, right? Now, if I don't mention all four when I mention one, the other three send me a note. They'll have a representative from their firm waiting for me when I get home tonight, okay? <laughs> so we have EY, Ernst & Young, KPMG, PWC and Deloitte, you have to mention all four. If you don't mention all four, God hears you and says, hey, they left you when you left you out today. Okay? Okay, good. Question. Now, um, when you take a look, I wanted to show you the financial reports. Looks like they're going to give me a hard time to do that. I'm not sure why hitting the back button didn't do it. And um, you saw the different financial statements. Statement of operations is the um, income statement. Statement of comprehensive income is a separate statement. Um, balance sheet, statement of stockholders' equity, etc. But remember, in that little graphic we saw, there was also the notes, okay? So it's important to realize that notes to the financial statements are pretty extensive, aren't they? 
and the auditor's responsibility does extend to those notes. It's not just the financial statements, it's also the notes, right? Okay. Now, I don't know why when I hit the back button, it doesn't take me just back to that last page. Keep having to do it this annoying way, but that's all right. Now, the other thing I want to point out to you is all of this other stuff that is next to the financial statements. For example, do you see this MDNA? See the MDNA? Is the auditor's responsibility extend to the MDNA? I mean, it's right next to the financial statements. Does the auditor's responsibility extend to the MDNA? No, it's just those what? Financial statements and the notes that our opinion covers, right? Even though there's all this other stuff, like this MDNA that's right next to the financial statements. However, there is the, the, the opinion covers that. I shouldn't say the auditor's responsibility. The opinion covers the financial statements and the notes. However, there is some degree of responsibility that extends to this MDNA. And the auditor is responsible for making sure that the MDNA is consistent with what we know to be the facts based on the financial statements. Because the MDNA is going to have excerpts from the financials, do analysis based on the financials, we have to look at that MDNA and see if they show net income going up for the last five years. And we're like, well, no, it just went down. We would be required to ask for a correction in that MDNA. And if they refuse to correct it, we would have to call out in our opinion, hey, we're giving an unqualified, uh, unmodified opinion on the financial statements, but you should be aware of this inconsistency in the MDNA. Okay. But our responsibility really, uh, the opinion really covers what? covers those financial statements that we saw on that slide. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and go back then to the slides. Any questions on any of that? Okay, good. Now you come over and we have something called a test engagement. <laughs> And a test engagement means that we are going to give some sort of a, um, some sort of um, assurance on a subject matter. Okay. Now, when we do an audit, we're auditing the financial statements, but we could give an attestation on something other than the financial statements. So, even though our opinion does not extend to the MDNA, we could be asked to give an opinion on the MDNA, but when we do, we do not call that an audit anymore. We call it an attest engagement. Okay? So, an attest engagement means that we are testifying. Attest testifying. We are saying that we believe that the financial statements are fairly stated. When we're auditing the financial statements, we call that an audit. If we're giving an attestation on something, testifying on something other than the financial statements, then we call that an attest engagement. Okay? So uh, you can see, for example, we could be engaged to examine the MDNA. If we do, we call that an attest. When we're looking at the financial statements and giving an assurance on that, we call that an audit. Okay? Now, we could also attest to non-financial things. For example, when we give that opinion on the effectiveness of the internal control, we don't call that an audit. We call that an attest. Okay? So you start to look at some of these different types of assurance services that could be given. For example, we could give assurance on cyber risk assessment assurance, et cetera. Okay? So when you look at this, an audit is an assurance engagement. When we're talking about the financial statements, that is called an audit. If we're giving what? An assurance about some of those other things like the MDNA, the internal control, 
we call that an attest, but it is still what? An assurance. And then when you get further away from audit and you start giving assurance on things like the um, some of those issues that are on this slide, like the cyber risk, etc., then you just call that assurance. Okay, so all audits are assurance engagements. Okay, all audits are attest engagements, but not all attest engagements are audits. Okay, for example, the MDNA is an attest, but it is not an audit. Not all all audits and attests are insurance, but not all assurance are what? A test or audits. Okay? Makes sense? All audits are assurance engagements. Right? All attests are insurance engagements. All audits are attest engagements. Not all attest engagements are audits, though. Okay. It's a little confusing, right? Okay. But uh, we'll get more into some of these other engagements towards the end of the class here. Our main focus is going to be what? Is going to be audit. It's going to be the stuff that leads to this audit of the financial statements. Okay. But you do have a test engagements that are not audits, even though an audit is an attest. You have attest engagements that are not audits, and then you have things that get even further from the financial statements that are considered what? Considered just straight assurance services. Okay? Okay, good. Management is responsibility for the financial statements. And that responsibility for public companies extends to the federal statute, Sarbanes-Oxley. Now, I mentioned Section 404. There are a lot of sections to Sarbanes. And one of the things that Sarbanes does in Section 302 is make severe penalties available for those that uh, cause there to be fraudulent financial reporting in a company's financial statements. In other words, if you commit fraud in your financial statements, you will be showering with strangers, okay, in a federal facility. Okay. Okay, good. Financial statement assertions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce financial statement assertions to you right now, but we're going to dig into them next time, okay, because I don't think we can finish it in time, and I don't want to not give this sufficient time, okay, because when we look at financial statements, we look at them from the standpoint of what? Of the, when we look at financial statements, we look at it from the standpoint of financial assertions. Financial statements are made up of assertions. So we're not looking at cash. We're looking to see that cash is complete. We're not looking at equipment. We're looking to see that equipment exists. And we're going to line up audit procedures along those assertions. Okay? So let me just do a quick example. Which side should I do it on? I'll do it on both sides. I'll do one over here and I'll do one over there. So let's say we have our income statement. And on the income statement, we show our sales. whatever that is, okay? Now, do we have something that supports the financial statements? Is there something that feeds into the financial statements? Okay. Yes, invoices, but be, but that's a little too far downstream. Closer to the financial statement. 
Okay, I'm thinking a little more basic than that, guys. I'm looking for the general ledger. Minus one equals huh? Minus one equals huh? Equals minus one? No. I'm, I'm, I'm real basic here, guys. I'm looking for the general ledger. Okay, general ledger feeds into the financial statements, I know. I mean, look, I'm asking you a question that I know the answer to, and you're, I'm kind of making you read my mind here, right? So I understand that. Okay, then what? Then, feeding into the general ledger, we have what? You're okay. You're all right. Relax. I won't. I won't. I won't bump into you. Feeding into the general ledger, we have what? Journal entries? Huh? Journal well, feeding into the general ledger, yeah. We usually don't make journal entries, though, at the... Um, at the uh, GL level, we have what? Subsidiary ledgers, such as what? Such as our sales ledger. <coughs> We're going to have our sales in there. Okay, and when we have a sale, we will have what? Huh? We'll have sales listed in there, right? And those sales will consist of invoice number one for a hundred thousand, invoice number two for seventy-five thousand. Invoice number three for fifty thousand and invoice number seventeen for a million dollars. And I'm just jumping down to invoice 17. I mean, as an auditor, we'd be very concerned if all of a sudden we jumped to invoice 17. But I want to sit here and write 17 numbers. I just want to represent that there's a bunch of different invoices in the sales journal, right? Okay, not sales uh, ledger, but sales journal. So when we look, yes, we're auditing the financial statements. But there's all kinds of things that feed into these financials, right? So it's not like the auditor starts here. The auditor is going to do what? They are first going to go in, by the way, and reconcile the financial statements to the general ledger, the general ledger to the subsidiary ledgers, the subsidiary ledgers to the uh, supporting journals and that sort of thing, right? What happens if I go to reconcile the sales that's reported in the income statement and doesn't match the general ledger, doesn't match the sales journal? What should I do? They show $10 million of sales. And when I add up the sales journal, it shows $8 million of sales. What should I do? Go to management and say, huh? I'll probably go to management, high-level step, add up the sales journal. Doesn't match what they said on sales and the income statement. What am I going to do? Huh? I'm going to add up the sales journal. I'm going to add up every single invoice that's in there, and I'm going to see that it matches what's in the general ledger for the sales. And then I'm going to see that that's what's in the general ledger matches what they put on the income statement. So what happens if I add up the sales journal and it only shows eight million of sales, and the income statement is showing <coughs> ten million? What should I do? What should I do? If the thing that is supposed to represent the financial statements does not match, just tell management that you're doing this wrong. Or just report by No. No. None of this. <laughs> I'm going to go to management. I'm going to say, well, <coughs> bye. I've got nothing to audit. 
if the accounting records don't match what's on the financial statements, why am I going to start pulling things from this sales journal to see if there's support for it when it's not even adding up to the financial statements? Something is seriously wrong here. And I'm not going to start doing all kinds of audit procedures, garbage in, garbage out. If that doesn't reconcile, I have nothing to audit. First thing I do is make sure that the thing that I'm going to be doing my work in, which is going to be this sales journal where the details are, better match the thing that I'm going to give my opinion on. And if it doesn't match, I'm done. I can't audit that. Now, if you want to pay me to come in and figure out your mess, that's another engagement. But these need to match. But I would have to at least check to make sure they do, right? So I don't start auditing something that ends up being garbage. Okay? Now, so I do this reconciliation. Okay. This is representing that number in the, over there, isn't it? The, the, uh, this is representing the universe here. Right? Okay. So now I want to see if something that's recorded in here is correct. So let's say I want to look and I want to see, did this really happen? What am I going to do? I'm going to go to supporting documents. For example, how about the actual sales invoice? So I'm going to go and I'm going to find sales invoice number one. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to find sales invoice number one. I'm going to look to see that it says, what is it, 100,000? And if I start over here and I come over here and I find this sales invoice and there's something <laughs> supporting what's in the sales journal, isn't there? So I found some support. Anything else I want to do here? I'm just happy with this invoice. Well, I might send out confirmations if I'm trying to confirm accounts receivable. And in auditing related account, I might also ask that customer about specific invoices. So, yes, I could do that. But let's just stick to auditing the sales journal at this point, not a combined audit procedure where I'm confirming, say, another account like accounts receivable at the same time. Anything else I can do here? Huh? The return. Okay, well, I could do something to see that if there were any discounts, they were properly applied and that discount got reflected in a sales discount account or something like that. Sure, I could do that with this particular selected invoice. But let's just stick with 100000 is what's in here. I see an invoice for 100000 Is there anything else I can do with this invoice? If they don't ship the goods, did they have a sale? No. Maybe if they were holding those for some period of time or something in the sale. But a shipping document would be pretty good evidence that there was a sale, right? So I might look for the shipping document. I might look for the shipping document that showed that that was shipped, and I might look to see what the date was. It was shipped on, you know, November 30th, 2019, and if I'm auditing the 2019 income statement, I know that that was shipped in time, but I also might look at the shipping terms. Was it free on board shipping point or free on board destination? It was free on board destination. I'm going to have to look to see when it got there as well, right? Okay. All right. So I'm going to do these things. I have this sales invoice. Um, how about a sales order? Was there an order 
from a customer. So I'm doing what, guys? I'm starting with the sales journal, which is the representation of what's in the financial statements, and I'm going out to see if there's support for that, right? We call that assertion existence. Did that sale actually exist? Did that sale actually existence occurrence? Did that sale actually occur? Existence occurrence are kind of married assertions. That says existence occurrence. Did that sale actually occur? I found it in the sales invoice, didn't I? I mean, in the sales journal, I should say. And I got evidence. Remember, we use evidence, don't we? To see that it actually occurred. Okay. Now, let's say that I take this number 17 and I come over and there's no invoice. What am I going to do? I picked that number 17, I came over, I tried to find the invoice, can't find it. What am I going to do? I'm going to go, excuse me, management, I've got a million dollar invoice here. You had it recorded in your sales journal. We went to find the invoice and it's not there. And management says, oh, thank you, auditor. That was Bob. Bob used to make that mistake all the time. We let him go. <laughs> now, at this point, we're going to talk more about professional skepticism next time. My professional skepticism bell is ringing, isn't it? Because I'm sitting there going, well, wait a minute. Wouldn't management like to overstate their sales? Makes their net income look bigger? Is it really that Bob made a mistake and they let him go? Or was this intentional, right? Because we have to look for a material misstatement, whether caused by error or fraud. And my professional skepticism bell will start to ring. Okay? So for the existence assertion, you do what? You select a transaction from the, and they always say from the financial statements. And financial statements don't have transactions on them. They have line items. You have to make sure the financial statements reconcile to where you're going to start to do your audit work, which is in the representation of financial statements, the sales journal here. You pull a transaction and you go look for evidence in support of that. That is the existence assertion. When you're auditing existence, you come from the financial statements to the supporting documents, right? Okay. Now, it is also possible... I'll try to wrap this up quickly here, guys, because I know we're running out of time. To do this, I can start at the invoice. And I can find invoice number two. And invoice number two says that it's for 75000 And I can find the shipping doc. I can find the sales order. But now I'm going to start here and I'm going to come back here. I didn't start here. I started over there, didn't I? We call that assertion completeness. I'm looking to see that the financial information contained in the sales journal is complete, that everything that's here, that, that should be here, is here. That's completeness. Now, let's say I pull sales invoice number four, and I find the shipping documents, et cetera. I don't know rewrite that I find the, and I come over here and I look 
is sales invoice here, four here? Is sales invoice four here? Is it here? No. It's not here. So I go to management, I say, well, look, you had this sales number four, and we can't find it in the sales journal. What happened? The sales journal's not complete. And management says, oh, that was Bob. He used to make that mistake, too. We let him go. Now, my professional skepticism bell is doing something different now because I'm like, why would they want to understate sales? If they understate sales, net income is smaller. Usually, we want a bigger net income, don't we? Ah. Maybe they're trying to figure out a way to bring the tax down. Or maybe they think their sales is enough for this year. And they're going to let that sales invoice fall behind the filing cabinet or whatever. And then they'll, oh, is the auditor gone? Good, get that thing out of there and put it in this year's sales so they get a nice head start on the next year's sales, right? So my professional skepticism bell is still ringing, isn't it? You always have that professional skepticism bell okay so those are two assertions we talked about right up there see those up there existence occurrence okay and we're gonna do a heck of a lot more than this when it comes to auditing sales there's a lot more to it than just these little things but this is the way we have to start moving our thinking towards what are the smart ways to audit the assertions what I just described to you was directional testing Directional testing says for existence, go from the financial statement. And again, you can't pull transactions off a of financial. You got to find the lowest common denominator, like the sales journal. Pull the transactions from the financial statement to the supporting docs. That's existence occurrence. For what? For completeness, we're going to do what? Other direction from the supporting docs to the financial statements, right? To help us with completeness okay all right we'll talk more about the rest of these assertions next time so it looks like next time is when we will finish chapter one we'll take the quiz and the uh, homework for chapter one in the meantime go ahead and get into connect you can see start to see those homework questions even though we'll go through them together next time and keep your eye on connect I'm gonna see how much of the homework I can just release into connect so you can have the whole as much of the whole thing there as possible to mess around with okay all right any questions guys huh nothing is ever due okay the only thing that is due is you on the day of the exam with the knowledge in your head okay that is what's due I will give you the points for the quiz and the homework um, when I start posting them up as word files sometimes what I'll do is I'll start it and I'll say okay guys we're running out of time finish it we'll come back and talk about it next time and I do get kind of uh, upset if then I say okay what would you get for number three and everybody's like which means nobody did it so um, so if we do that I'll ask you to finish it but it's I'm never gonna hold you say turn it in uh, you didn't do it we're too smart for that, okay? All right, guys, I will see you next time, okay?